The dawn of the Roaring Twenties opened a new chapter in the 20th century. The war to end all wars had ended, and American troops returned home victorious to celebrations around the country. Yet beneath the surface, the sentiment was very different. President Woodrow Wilson spent 1919 and 1920 touring the country and promoting the League of Nations. Wilson believed that U.S. involvement in international affairs was a necessary step to guarantee peace, even though the fighting in Europe was over. But public opinion indicated a majority of Americans were in no mood to listen. The austerity and sacrifice of the war years had worn down morale. Most citizens wanted to return to the good old days that the war had so abruptly interrupted. America was mired in a struggle of its own. The economy was in recession, and the nation faced widespread unemployment and labor unrest. Farm prices were slipping to new lows, while the cost of living soared. Americans were ready for social and political change. When November came, that change was embodied by Republican Warren G. Harding, who many hoped could return the country to the good old days. Harding was elected by a resounding majority, trouncing Democratic contender James Cox and his running mate, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The 1920 election also introduced a new constituency, women. The hard-fought battle for women's suffrage was won when Congress passed the 19th Amendment, giving women political independence and forever altering the social and political landscape. I was among the first ones to vote when they would let women vote. And it was really a big thing in the world when women were allowed to have a hand in the, the making of the world. Under Harding, the tempo of American life returned to normal. Signs of boom were seen in many sectors of society. Employment levels rose as industry and manufacturing increased. Technological advances developed for the war were now applied to consumer goods, from electric bulbs to automobiles. The surplus of World War I pilots pushed aviation's growth in new directions. Airmail first ventured into the skies with service between New York and San Francisco. America's move into a new mechanized age also initiated a shift in population. For the first time in history, the start of the 20s saw 51% of the country living in cities. New jobs, new beginnings, and new opportunities brought the level of optimism to new heights, and time for leisure and entertainment increased. On July 29, 1923, in a San Francisco hotel, President Harding, already weakened from the flu and the stress of scandal, died from a cerebral hemorrhage. Though his popularity had waned, the outpouring of affection was immense. Crowds of mourners gathered at every stop along the funeral train's journey and sang the president's favorite hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Harding's replacement was Vice President Calvin Coolidge. Two men could not be more different. Silent and serious, Coolidge was a prim Puritan from New England stock. Yet in an age of excesses and fads, the old-fashioned Coolidge was loved by the people. Coolidge went right to work, ordering investigations into scandals, firing many Harding appointees, and settling down to govern. His conservative philosophy was simple. Less government is best. The economic boom that began under Harding continued sustained growth under Coolidge. New housing boomed in suburban areas as the population continued to shift to the cities. Americans had jobs, earned more, and had ample time to spend it. The work week shrank, and some companies even began offering two-week paid vacations. People attributed the robust economy to the conservative leadership of President Coolidge. When the elections of 1924 arrived, the president rode the wave of the booming economy and his widespread popularity into another term in office. He proceeded to cut taxes, decrease spending, 
and trim $3 billion from the national debt. The rise of communism in Russia indirectly contributed to policy in the United States. The Russian Revolution and subsequent Red Scare of 1920 heightened the anti-immigrant sentiment that had been building since the end of World War I. Many were worried that immigrants would take jobs from native-born Americans. Others had long suspected dissident immigrants to be the cause of labor unrest. There had been tremendous pressure in the United States to create a restrictive immigration act. And this began to happen in the 1920s. The 1924 act in particular was based on a quota system. And the quota system favored entry for individuals from Northern and Western Europe. Now, this was a reaction against the thousands and millions who were coming in from Southern and Eastern Europe. It was also an effort to keep America white, northern European. While the crackdown on immigration continued, racial hatred smoldered under the cloak of the Ku Klux Klan. Gaining members daily from the ranks of poor and bigoted whites, the Klan witnessed a resurgence unseen since Reconstruction days counting 300,000 members in Ohio alone. They cast their net of blame not only on blacks, but also upon immigrants, Jews, and Catholics. The legitimate press was more concerned with a trial in Dayton, Tennessee. In 1925, a young biology teacher named John Scopes was arrested for teaching Charles Darwin's theory of evolution in his classroom. Tennessee law only allowed for the biblical creation story. The Scopes Monkey Trial gained national attention and featured two prominent figures on opposing sides, William Jennings Bryant, a three-time presidential candidate, and Clarence Darrow, America's most renowned lawyer. Scopes was convicted and fined $100, but this ruling was later overturned. By 1927, the nation's infrastructure was growing. The boom in cars contributed to new roads and a highway system, offering new options in transportation. American Telephone and Telegraph connected the world by laying the first transatlantic telephone cable. Gutzon Borglum began his monumental sculpture on Mount Rushmore, immortalizing Presidents Washington, Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Lincoln. However, the most captivating story of 1927 belonged to a young aviator named Charles Lindbergh. Like all flyers of the 20s, he pushed the limits of technology to go higher, faster, and farther. On May 27th, he achieved a place in history by being the first man to fly nonstop across the Atlantic. Starting in New York, his single-engine Spirit of St. Louis touched down in Paris 33 hours and 29 minutes later. An international hero, the shy 25-year-old was given a ticker tape parade in New York City and the Congressional Medal of Honor. His heroic flight inspired poems, songs, and even a dance called the Lindy Hop. Lindbergh's success propelled commercial aviation forward. By the end of the decade, 44 airlines were flying passengers across the land. By the time the presidential election of 1928 rolled around, President Calvin Coolidge, in his typical low-key fashion, announced, without explanation, that he would not seek another term as president. The race was open to two new candidates, Republican Herbert Hoover and his opponent Al Smith. The presidential race ushered in a new element in campaign strategy. For the first time, radio played a key role in deciding the election. Voters believed Hoover's policy of a limited government and his association with Coolidge would ensure continued economic prosperity. When November came, they ushered Hoover into office with a solid victory over Smith. The next major change in automobiles took place with another Ford, which would have been the Model A introduced in 1928. That car was so vastly superior to the Model T that uh, Ford immediately had uh, a backlog of orders for it. It was more stylish. Uh, they were finding out then that people bought cars on the base of style as well. 
By the last year of the decade, the country was tiring of prohibition. Gangsters once thought to be the champions of the people by providing a never-ending flow of liquor were seen as brutal thugs. On February 14th, Al Capone ordered the death of his rival Bugs Moran and his gang. Headlines called it the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Though it didn't quell our thirst for liquor, it heightened the effort to rid the streets of mob control. Reeling from corruption and graft in their police force, Chicago turned to a federal agent for help. Elliot Ness and his band of incorruptible agents were known as the Untouchables. The Untouchables spearheaded a multi-pronged assault on Capone, an assault that broke new ground in the nation's gang-busting efforts. In 1929, the world watched as the latest marvel of airborne technology took to the skies. The German Graf Zeppelin set a new record for around-the-world air travel by circling the globe in 21 days, 7 hours, and 26 minutes. The impressive craft carried 16 passengers and a crew of 37 and made only three stops during her journey. When the Graf Zeppelin landed, amazed citizens everywhere celebrated. America and the world rode the optimistic crest of the Roaring Twenties out of 1928 and into 1929. This optimism was reflected by the public's interest in the stock market. Investors large and small poured their savings into investments. Even average citizens became fluent in reading stock reports and ticker tape. Stocks were bought on credit or margin for a fraction of their true value by investors hoping to turn speculation into sizable profits. In mid-October, stock prices fell as a wave of selling engulfed the market. A group of concerned bankers bought $20 million of stocks and halted the slide. Then on October 29, 1929, Black Tuesday, the bull market that had lurched ahead for almost 10 years, came to a crashing halt. Panic erupted as frightened investors ordered their brokers to sell. Thousands of accounts were wiped out as a record number of shares were traded. By the end of the day, $15 billion evaporated into thin air, and with it, the savings of millions. Those who once enjoyed the boom of the 20s now milled about in unemployment lines. By November, three million Americans were out of work. Banks were overrun with those trying to collect their savings. Businesses dwindled, and many companies closed their doors. President Herbert Hoover remained optimistic, yet his optimism could not hide the truth. The consequences of nearly a decade of uncontrollable economic boom and inflation rested on his shoulders. The Great Depression had begun.